much viewers for staying with us right here at uh, Roma 313. Very happy to have a very, very special uh, guest. Uh, I'll just let him introduce himself and your title. Thank you. My name is Mark Weber. I'm a historian. I live in Southern California. It's a pleasure being with you. I'm director of the Institute for Historical Review. Our focus is on current affairs from a historical perspective and historical uh, issues as they relate to issues today. The big reason I'm in Iran, this is my second visit, is because I'm above all concerned about the problem, the danger of war, which I think would be a catastrophe, not just for Iran, of course, but for the whole world. The only country that I think is trying to push for war and has an interest in it is Israel. And that's a big concern for me because our institute and my focus especially is on the causes of conflict and the resolution and the impact of those. Mm -hmm. Causes of conflict and resolution were right. wild. Lots of conflicts right. around the world today. Right. Now, let's look at the, the situation. You, you mentioned Iran, so we'll start there. Right. How likely do you think that there will be a war taking place? When I was here in September, I was surprised because every Iranian I talked to was sure there would not be a war, even though there was a war psychosis back in the United States and all these threats of war. And I, I do think that maybe the high point was when Netanyahu had his funny cartoon at the United Nations. That was perhaps the biggest time of danger. And I think the danger is much less now because I think there is a much more sober realization, even in the United States, that a war would be a, a terrible, terrible thing. And I think Obama is trying to balance, on the one hand, his desire to avoid a war with a desire to still placate the Israel lobby in the United States and in Israel. And I think there's a possibility, I think we should be uh, hopefully optimistic about right now some sort of resolution of this whole thing because I, I, the, the issues are such that they, I think, can be and should be resolved. So I think the greatest danger of war is already passed and also uh, Netanyahu didn't do as well in the election so he doesn't have quite the same mandate as he, as he had. So I'm cautiously optimistic that the danger of war is certainly less and that even perhaps some sort of solution can be worked out. Who would you say it would be the entities that would benefit from a war on Iran? I think the only benefit would be Israel. And it's a kind of odd, uh, screwy uh, idea of benefit. But Israel is on a course that is opposed to not only, of course, the interests of Palestinians and others in the Middle East, but is harm increasingly and more obviously harmful, I think, to the interests of, of the rest of the world. It's remarkable that recently in the United Nations, that even many, most of the European states were either neutral or supported statehood status for Palestine against the objections of the United States and against the objections of Israel. In other words, increasingly around the world, I think there's an awareness not only that Israel's uh, aggressive measures and oppressive measures are bad, but that they're harmful to the interests of, of everyone. And it's Israel that is unquestionably, I mean undis indisputably, the big factor pushing for uh, threatening Iran and pushing for war against Iran a, a, in, a, in a way that's of course obviously hypocritical. You have done a lot of work in, in dealing with Zionism and looking at Zionism. Right. Uh, well let's start right here where we are with the, the war and threatening war on Iran and how does Zionism play in all of this? Well, uh, the, the, the real problem is that the organized Jewish community in America, the Jewish lobby, the Israel lobby, uh, American Jews are overwhelmingly very sympathetic to Israel. And that has expressed itself in the very odd relationship the United States has with Israel, the U.S. support for Israel. It's an unbelievable thing that from its very beginning in 1948 up to the present, Israel has required constant support from the outside even to stay in place. That's a dangerous and artificial situation. And the uh, support, Israel's uh, very existence, much less its sustaining its, its place in the world since then, would not have been possible without the backing of the United States, which in turn is an expression, I think, of the powerful Israel-Jewish lobby in the United States. I think people... Uh I'm sure inside the United States too, but outside of the United States, it cannot grasp, it cannot understand how a, uh, a small minority of people right. have gotten control 
of that vast land. Right. This is a very good point. I find this over and over because it is amazing and hard to understand mm -hmm. how a group that makes up two, three percent of the population can right. have that kind of power. Right. And I'm going to try to deal with it as I do on other occasions. Mm -hmm. The, the Jewish community in America is very well organized. It's well to do, it has a great deal of money, and it has a cohesion and a focus that the rest of Americans don't have. In fact, the Jewish community encourages most Americans to think of themselves as individuals, while at the same time promoting an extremely strong, uh, cohesive, collective consciousness for them. And any group that has a strong, a collective sense, community sense, among people who don't are going to have vastly more power. But even so, I, I, you're, you make a very good point. It's very hard to understand how that power can be so great and how American politicians can be beholden to that power. It is, it is amazing, but it's important for people to understand that. How independent are the majority of American politicians at this point? From separate from that Israeli lobby, uh, lobby Jewish lobby. I think it, it's remarkable that when Netanyahu speaks in Congress of the United States, he gets more rapturous applause than the American president. He gets more rapturous applause than he do, than he does even from the Israeli parliament. Right. It's a token of just how beholden, how corrupt, really, American politicians have have become mm -hmm. to this power because they know that if they. Uh, cross or run counter to this power, their careers will be destroyed. They'll be smeared, they'll be called names, and that'll be the end of it. Mm. And so they all have to watch their backside, as it were, to yeah. make sure they, that this doesn't happen. But it's, it's, a, it's a terrible commentary on the American political system mm. that that's the reality. We've seen some interesting things, especially um, recently. Um, I remember uh, President Obama, when he was addressing um, the um, APAC right. and, and talking to them and it was very interesting because he brought the name Israel even before he brought the name of the United right. States right. and it was as if he's the, you know their president. Right. Another very interesting point recently I think was the Democratic uh, Convention. Um, it was mind-boggling um, if you recall when they were talking about voting uh, they wanted to vote this is Jerusalem as the right. official capital right. of right. Israel and, and of course when they took this uh, this vote and it was obviously, it was balanced, and then when they took it again, it was obviously the majority right. of people were against it. And immediately he says, and it passed, so yeah. it's obvious, you know, okay, that Jerusalem, well, this is going to be put on our agenda. Right. The first question would be, why would an American care? Why should that be right. Right. on the official agenda right. of an American political party? Right. Oh, it's amazing. That when the uh, Romney and Obama were having their so-called debate on foreign policy, yeah. Israel dominated the discussion. Israel and Iran dominated the discussion, as if the rest of the world doesn't really exist. Right. It's a shameful thing that our politicians seem to care more about the interests and security of Israel than even not only the interests of the United States, but certainly any other country in the world. It's mm -hmm. shameful, and it's a betoken. It's a, it's an expression of something very seriously wrong in the American system. Well, I think one of the things that brings us to then is uh, something that's related to this conference. Uh, of course, that's dealing with Hollywood. We're talking not just Hollywoodism, but uh, the media, the right. mass media right. in general, right. in trying to keep the masses. Uh, basically unaware. Right. How effective have they been in dealing with the American population? One point I keep reminding people is that polls have shown that a majority of Americans, in one poll 70 percent, another 80 percent, believe Iran already has nuclear weapons. It shows the extent to which the American public can be persuaded to believe something patently untrue. And that's an expression of the extent to which the American public is misinformed, mm -hmm. misguided, misled. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very stern indictment of just how bad the situation is. That a majority of Americans can believe something so patently, obviously, untrue. Right. And believe that uh, Israel is the only democratic power in the right. in, in Middle East and protecting America's right. interests. Well, one expression also is that the American government will not even acknowledge what everyone knows to be true, that Israel has a large and illicit nuclear weapons arsenal. And the American government will not even acknowledge this. It will not say publicly, for example, that Israel's settlements policy is illegal. 
All it will say is, oh, it's harmful to the peace process. That's the most it will say. Mm -hmm. But it's actually illegal under international law. And the fact that the United States over and over vetoes resolutions in the United Nations to hold Israel accountable for its actions is also one more expression of the power of this lobby, which is, of course, backed up by Hollywood. And that's why this conference, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. Well, with the uh, corporate media and... Um unfortunately being so blatant and obvious these days, how can we be able to counter that mass influence that they have on Americans and the rest of the world also? That's a hard thing. That's a very good question and it's really difficult. As you know, all sorts of restrictions are put on press TV from having its role in the world and other media as well. I, I mean, there's a tremendous chasm between, you might say, the mass media and what people who want to be informed and educated can find out because if they really want to the kinds of facts and information that we're talking about are available mm -hmm. but people are so in intimidated and then the political leadership has failed in its duty to talk openly and honestly with the American people about these very issues but I think the uh, main focus of our effort and this is what we try to do as well is on that small minority of people who have both the soul to care about these issues and the intelligence to, uh, to, to grasp them. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> in every society, that's always really a minority. But I think that's the crucial minority that because we have very limited resources compared to the vast power of Hollywood and the big media mm -hmm. that we have to focus on. Of course, any individual or entity that stands up against Zionism usually have to pay a very heavy price. And of course, you're sitting here in the Islamic Republic of Iran who has and continues to pay a very heavy price for standing right. uh, up against uh, Zionism. Uh, I wonder about your personal story. Uh, how has it affected you standing up for what you believe and standing against Zionism in the United States? Well, how has it affected you? Well, in my personal life and my family, of course, I, I, it's, it's, it's good. But I've, been, I've, I've paid a price personally in many ways. In fact, when I uh, came back from the first visit to Iran, the Anti-Defamation League, which as you know is one of the most influential Zionist organizations in America, issued a, a, a statement denouncing me. It was just complete misrepresentation of, mm -hmm. of the reality and so forth. Mm -hmm. It does hurt sometimes, and it ha I, I have paid a price over the years uh, for, I think, trying to do what I think other people ought to be doing, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm trying to do because others, I think, are not doing the job. They, they are. How do we get beyond that? Because uh, we, we have many individuals who stand up for the truth in the United States or in Europe, especially these uh, two areas of the world, and immediately they're labeled as conspiracy theorists right. or um, very negative connotations right. connected with. How can we get beyond that? Because it's very difficult. It it's, is it's difficult. A high personal there, there's no, I, I think there's no easy answer to that. I think you know that. Um, I think we just have to be persistent because I think in reaching, the, I think a minority of people who actually care about these things, truth and logic and facts do matter mm -hmm. to those people. Perhaps not the majority because of course for most Americans, like most people in, in any country, foreign affairs in the Middle East are far away from their concerns. They're worried mostly of course about jobs, about being able to put uh, money, uh, food on the table, being able to pay their mortgage or their rent. That's a concern of most Americans, and by sort of default, they've left foreign affairs, even mm -hmm. though it affects all of us in terms of huge amounts of money spent and so forth, to the small minority that, of course, is really focused on that. But it is difficult. Well, you how do we get them to understand that all these issues are actually interrelated? You, you just talked about basically putting food on the plate and, and making, you know, uh, the wages or whatever, making the salaries. However, it is interconnected. Right with that international right. element. Right. And, and do you think that if we can somehow um, basically get the word out as far as this interconnection, that there will be less separation between people they won't see as, as Americans or Iranians or, right. or whatever, but uh, the 99% altogether. Right. That's exactly a worthy goal. Uh, one of the attendees at this conference is former U.S. Uh, Senator Mike Gravel. Right. He's made it, he's tried in his way also to make people understand, Americans understand, that these wars in the Middle East, in Iraq, or threats of wars against uh, Iran and so forth, have real consequences for Americans. It means we don't have housing that we should have. We don't have schools that we should have. We don't have roads fixed that we ought to. And this, of course, does affect us. But 
uh, we just have to slug along and try our best to enlighten and raise awareness about these issues because, as you say, they really do have impact not just for Iran or for the Middle East, but for us here, in a, us in the United States, of course, and, and around the world. Well, thank you so much for being with us. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. It has